are welcome in uh, your delegation. We are meeting today to receive a, a presentation from your side to speak to us. To us. So I'm going to propose that uh, and I'll go must mute. Thank you. Am I am I audible enough? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I think without any waste of time, let, let us invite the, the chairperson of the, of, of, of the board, uh, Mr. Matthews, to lead the, the team. Uh, just uh, introduce the team and also uh, from our side, uh, we'll just introduce ourselves because it is for the first time that we are meeting with the, with the NTT. Uh, my name is Cheney Mwingmang. Uh, from the Northern Cape province as a permanent delegate. Can we allow members to introduce themselves? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson. My name is Honorable Mushodi. I'm the member of this committee. I'm coming from the Free State province. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thanks. Good morning, Chair. It's My name is Dango. Honorable Chairperson, I come from the Gauteng province. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning to everybody. I am Sonia Bosov, a member of this committee, and I represent Mpumalanga. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Bosov. Honorable Khai. Yeah, good day, everyone. Uh, I have a challenge with my uh, camera. I'll just put it on and switch it off so that you can see me. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jacques Lund, and I'm here on behalf of the Western Cape. Thank you, Honorable Lund. Uh, Honorable Tim. Good morning, everyone. Tim Browdeset, member of the Select Committee representing the great state or province of KwaZulu-Natal. Thank you. Honorable Lapleni. Um, Temi Ngosea Pleni, I'm from the province of the Legends, Eastern Cape. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a particular round? Can we get the um, committee secretary and the researcher introducing themselves? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, my name is Lupeka Mtileni, I'm the committee secretary. Thank you, thank you. Hello? You're not audible. Uh, uh, can uh, Mem Pondo and Memolo introduce themselves? Chair, uh, my name is Kuki Moloi from the Deputy Minister's oh. Office, PLO. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, chair, good, good afternoon, Chair. I'm unable to do the picture so that you see me. Um, I'm Tandu Mpondo from the Minister's Office. I'm connecting through the phone due to network. Thank you. Uh, I want to believe that uh, we are fine. The rest is guests from the parliamentary monitoring group and also the the, the team from uh, from, from the uh, post regulator. Uh, over to you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson, and uh, to uh, members of the uh, committee. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by uh, thanking the members of the committee for the opportunity and the 
invitation to the Ports Regulator of South Africa to come and make a presentation uh, this afternoon. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce myself and the team from the Ports Regulator. My name is Zolani Hosile Matthews. I'm a member and chairperson of the board of the Ports Regulator of South Africa. With me here today is the newly appointed CEO of the Regulator, Ms. Joey Maloxi, as well as the CFO, Mr. Togozani Mshongo, and another member of the uh, board, Dr. Uh, Dr. Monyama. On behalf of the board uh, of, the, of the Regulator, I want to appreciate the Select Committee's invitation to present the annual report and performance of the Ports Regulator for the 2019 2020 financial year. Before the presentation, which will be done by the CEO and the CFO, I would like to provide some background on the Ports Regulator of South Africa, against which the 2019-2020 performance can be contextualized. Who is the regulator? Established in terms of the National Ports Act 12 of 2005, the regulator comprised members appointed by the Minister of Transport with knowledge, expertise, and competence in wide-ranging fields, including economics, regulation, legal, public, and development administration, as well as finance. We were appointed effectively from June 2020. The members of the regulator are part-time, and the current board is constituted of nine members and the CEO, who is ex officio. The members are appointed by the Minister of Transport, <clears throat> by which the regulator, the department which, which supports the regulator in its functions, and we have a secretariat which is headed administratively by the CEO. The responsibility of the regulator as outlined in section 30 of the National Ports Act, the regulator is responsible for the economic regulation of pricing and performance of South Africa's ports, which are managed by the National Ports Authority under Transnet. The, prom the promotion of equity of access to ports and to facilities and services provided in ports and for monitoring activities of the National Ports Authority to ensure that it complies with the National Ports Act. In essence, the port regulator sets the prices for the use of port infrastructure and services by shipping lines, tenants, and cargo owners. As late as 2015, the bulk of, trans of port tariffs were paid by cargo owners, which was over 60% of South Africa's import and export goods and services through each of our eight commercial ports. On the other hand, shipping lines bore only 18% of the charges. Our adopted tariff strategy aims to, over a period of time, to reduce the incidence on cargo owners to 35% whilst doubling the contribution by shipping lines. On an annual basis, by the 1st of August each year, the NPA submits a tariff application to the regulator for consideration, which tariff application is published and consulted widely with port users before a decision is taken and published within four months of the submission of the application. The tariff decision is taken after applying an established tariff methodology. The tariff strategy aimed at reforming tariffs, prevailing economic conditions, such as the effects of the current pandemic, and importantly, the need for the NPA to drive operational efficiencies of terminal operators that have contracted with us to improve our, or with the NPA to improve our port's competitiveness in global shipping logistics. The regulator also through the tribunal function, which affords them the opportunity to lodge a complaint or appeal the decision of the NPA with the regulator, ensures that the port users are treated fairly by the NPA. We then have the responsibility having exercised due process to hear a matter and make a ruling. The main outputs of the regulator are the decisions, commonly referred to as the record of decision, on the tariff application, the tribunals, and the research that supports these functions, some of which we publish and make available publicly. Chairpersons, the regulator is supported by a small staff complement, which carries out the technical work in forming the decisions of the board. Currently, the regulator staff members are only 22, and the organization operates from the offices it occupies in the city of Itaquani, with no provisional footprint, no provincial footprint. Relative to the NPA's average budget of 12 billion per annum, the regulator operates on a budget of under 45 million per annum. Despite the challenges with resources, the organization has endeavored to deliver on the economic regulation mandate for South Africa 
and has consistently kept port infrastructure and marine service prices well within inflation, even within the adopted price differentiation. Delivery on the full mandate of the organization is hampered by capacity and resource constraints for which proposals have been made to the Department of Transport on the approval of an agonogram that will allow the that will allow the resourcing of the entity. The review of funding model and legislation to enable the charging of a levy directly on the regulated services and enforcement powers for the in full implementation of the regulator's decisions and the corporatization of the NPA into a subsidiary of Transnet, which will allow it to operate fully as a landlord and port infrastructure company, and in the interest of the port system and its customers. The reported performance during the 2019-20 financial year is presented against this board background. At this stage, Chairperson, I would like to hand over to Ms. Malozzi and Mr. Mtlongo to take you through the specific and performance for the year under review, and, and we will obviously uh, be happy to answer any questions that the honorable members would like to, uh, would like to put to us uh, today. But I thought that it would be important to give that context and that background of the port regulator, because often you find that it's a very, it's a very little known uh, entity, yet it operates in a very strategic sense within the overall uh, transportation and maritime framework of our country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, uh, Over to you, CEO. Uh, thank you, Chairperson uh, of the Select uh, Committee and all protocol uh, observed. Uh, I will now upload the presentation uh, that I will take members through. Um, as a, as the just chairperson stop, uh, as, Yes, just show your face at the beginning and then from there you can... Uh, okay, thank you, chairperson. Because this lab, yes. Um, I'll stop sharing so that I can open the video and then I'll start sharing. Uh, my name is uh, Joey Mraudzi. As a chairperson has indicated, I have started in this role on the 1st of uh, January 2020. I will be doing the presentation on the organization's performance uh, for the 2019-20 financial year together with the chief financial officer, uh, who also doubles up as the corporate services manager, Mr. Togozan Mklongo. Uh, greetings to you, chair and members of the committee. Uh, I will now switch off the video and uh, share the presentation. Thank you, Ma'am May I confirm with you, Chair, that you can see my screen? Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, so. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, the presentation that we will take you through uh, reflects uh, what is captured in the audited uh, annual report of the Ports Regulator. Uh, for the performance of the organization, as well as the annual financial statements. Uh, these were adopted at the organization's annual general meeting, which was chaired by the Deputy Minister of Transport in November 2020, uh, and reflects uh, audited uh, results, as I've indicated. We'll look at the, just touch on the mandate of the regulator, uh, and our alignment with the national strategic objectives of government. I'll take you through the roles and functions of the accounting authority during the 2019-20 financial year and the governance issues that uh, pertain to the organization during that financial year. Uh, then we'll look at the audited organizational performance um, uh, together with the key projects and achievements for the financial year then the chief uh, financial officer will then come and cover a uh, financial management, uh, including uh, corporate services and uh, conclude the presentation by just highlighting 
the challenges that uh, pertains to the organization, not only for the 2019-20 financial year, but uh, these are ongoing challenges. In terms of the mandate of the organization, as the chairperson has uh, indicated in his remarks, we are established in terms of the National Ports Act, Act 12 of 2005, uh, Section 29 uh, establishes the regulator and Section 30 uh, outlines the functions of the regulator. The vision of the organization since it was established has been to uh, be regarded nationally as well as internationally as a world-class institution that sets standards for economic regulation in commercial maritime ports. And uh, we have played this role uh, and has sh have shared our experience with uh, other countries within the continent that are looking at uh, developing a similar model for economic regulation of ports. The mission of the organization, Chaperson, is drawn directly from the objectives uh, and the functions of the organizations, which are organization which are outlined in section 31 of the Act. And there are three primary functions to exercise economic regulation of the South African port system consistent with government strategic objectives. And the next slide uh, will talk to where we see alignment with government objectives. Uh, to promote equity of access to ports and uh, port facilities and services that are provided in the ports by the National Ports Authority under Transnet uh, and do so in a manner that supports and develops the port industry and the port system in line with the objectives of the uh, National, Commercial ports pol uh, National Commercial Ports Policy. And the third function, and uh, therefore our mission, is to monitor the activities of the National Ports Authority to ensure that it performs its function in accordance with the National Ports Act, specifically Section, 12, uh, Section 11 of the National Ports Act. The alignment of the organization with the national strategic objectives of government are summarized in the next two slides, and they cover uh, activities that have to do with the reduction of administered prices and the cost of doing business in South Africa, which is articulated both in the National Development Plan and the various MTSF uh, programs of government. The next uh, area is in terms of port prices, where we are to support uh, government's agenda for localization, beneficiation, and export and an export-oriented uh, growth um, through the monitoring uh, function uh, over the National uh, Ports Authority. The other area is in terms of uh, ensuring that there are efficiencies in the uh, port system, specifically looking at operations of terminals, again, through the oversight function on the National Ports Authority. Uh, then we also have a mandate which is in line with uh, the second uh, objective that objective that I've highlighted uh, that is to do with uh, transformation. If I can highlight just some of the uh, programs of the uh, port regulator in each of these, under the reduction of administered prices and the cost of doing business, the port regulator uh, aims to reduce the cost of living for South Africa and the cost of doing uh, business in the country. Um, and this is done uh, through the tariff methodology on which tariff determinations are based. In this methodology and tariff strategy, the regulator has differentiated pricing that supports uh, uh, lower prices for export through containers, which are a proxy for manufactured goods uh, from the country. The port regulator has significantly lowered approved tariffs uh, since the start of regulation, whilst maintaining the sustainability of the National Ports Authority. As an example, uh, over our period of existence, we have saved uh, the port uh, sector over 10 billion uh, through the uh, implementation of the tariff methodology and the decisions taken by the regulator. This is in terms of the difference between what the National Ports Authority applies for as an adjustment in tariffs year on year and what the regulator ultimately approves. That difference uh, amounted to 10 billion uh, during the year under review. 
The port regulator is also proactive in risk uh, mitigating uh, for port users. We establish an, a, a facility within the tariff methodology, which is called uh, the Excessive Tariff Increase Margin Credit Facility, ETIMC. This is the savings uh, count that accrues from previous years. And instead of reducing the full tariffs in the next year, a portion of that is saved and to, uh, so that the regulator is able to offset any future high increases in tariffs that would be necessitated by the investment required by the authority in CAPEX and all its other responsibilities. Currently, this uh, or under uh, during the year under review, that facility was uh, sitting at about two billion, and it has allowed the regulator over the years to sustain uh, tariff adjustments that are below inflation, as the chairperson has um, alluded to. Under port pricing reforms, uh, the regulator uh, consulted widely with port users and in July of 2015 published a port tariff strategy. And the aim of that strategy was to reform port infrastructure pricing over a 10 year period. And port infrastructure pricing specifically because we only regulate the National Port Authority, which is responsible for infrastructure. The tariff uh, strategies, uh, the importance of the tariff strategy is based on the fact that before it was developed, the tariffs of the authority um, did not have a comprehensive uh, a, a foundation uh, or a basis on which uh, the tariffs were, were, were determined. So the tariff uh, strategy uh, brings uh, in greater fairness cost reflectiveness and predictability of South Africa's uh, port pricing. Uh, as part of beneficiation, localization and industrialization, uh, the regulator developed under the tariff strategy, a port tariff incentive program. The strategy by and large indicates what each of the port users uh, that the chairperson referred to, uh, shipping lines, uh, tenants, as well as cargo owners what they should be paying in the port uh, system and the basis for arriving at the base tariffs. However, the regulator recognized that there will be requirement and instances where cross subsidies will have to take place in the port system. And the port tariff incentive program was developed to provide a, a framework within which those cross subsidies uh, can be applied in the port uh, system. Uh, on beneficiation, the tariff strategy maintains an average 70% lower prices for highly beneficiated South African manufactured uh, goods in export containers, as well as uh, export uh, vehicles. All automotive industry cargo juice have been equalized at full 60% discount level. Um, and this has reduced the cost of doing business for smaller uh, South African auto manufacturers and contributes to the beneficiation and industrialization um, and to objectives of government. On operational efficiencies in the port system, Chairperson, we have two main uh, intervention. One is the introduction of an incentive to encourage the port's authority to play the role that the, uh, that the port act uh, bestows on them, i.e. being a landlord port operator and the one that determines performance uh, standards for the terminal operators. Uh, we introduce what we call the weighted efficiency gains from operations we go, which effectively um, sets a framework by which the authority can be incentivized through additional uh, uh, profits uh, that they can earn achieved uh, up to 10% improvement in productivity and efficiencies in the port system. Con uh, on the other hand, if there is no improvement in the system, then the authority also um, suffers a reduction of their profits by up to 10%. This program is run in consultation with port users where we consult on an annual basis to determine the performance indicators that must be measured, the weight that must be assigned to those indicators, and uh, then the 
port uh, users through the port consultative committees, then monitors on a quarter, on a quarterly basis the authorities' uh, performance on the WIGO. Then at the end of uh, when the authority applies to the regulator in August, we have consolidated retail, uh, and results for the financial year. As we are speaking, uh, there are consultations that are taking place uh, for the port of uh, Cape Town, uh, specifically on this uh, particular project for the 2021-2022 uh, financial year. The second is in terms of um, supporting the funding proposals, uh, for the National Ports Authority's capital projects that are aimed at improving efficiencies uh, in the port system. And in the year under review, Operation Pagisa uh, projects were uh, supported and we continued to support the South African flagged vessel incentive as uh, in support of the Minister of Transport uh, pillar for the building block uh, of uh, and, uh, as a pillar one of the building blocks for the maritime program. Um, the ship registration initiative is part of the strategic objectives three in terms of the comprehensive maritime transport uh, policy. Lastly, then on transformation, the port regulator uh, started a project where we analyze the performance of the authority on an annual basis against the triple BEE objectives. And the outcome of that process is the advice that is provided to the Department of Transport, which is responsible for setting the regulations uh, to drive um, triple BEE and transformation uh, in, the in the sector. The uh, during the year under review, we had brought to the attention of the department the need for the 2009 regulations to be reviewed so that they are aligned with current practice. Uh, when they were adopted in 2009, the focus was mainly on ensuring that companies that the NPA contracts with are at least at level four triple BEE rating. The uh, developments in the industry have gone beyond that. We need to be addressing issues of ownership, empowerment of women, uh, people that come from um, uh, rural areas as well as uh, uh, townships, and the regulations uh, have to be updated to respond to that. So those are the broad areas in terms of alignment uh, with a government, broader government objectives. Uh, if I can then move on in. Uh, to the uh, programs uh, and uh, before the performance for 2019-20 to just talk about the governance issues that pertained to that particular financial year. Uh, as we've indicated, the regulator uh, is established in terms of the act and uh, the body itself, which normally constitutes up to 11 members, is the one that takes uh, decisions on regulation as well as on tribunals. During the 2019-20 financial year, we did not have a regulator um, and for a period of time. And the then Minister of Transport appointed the Chief Executive Officer then as the delegated accounting authority in terms of the provision of the uh, Public Finance Management Act. However, the CEO could only exercise prescribed accounting functions of the board but not the, uh, and the, 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 the regulatory functions of the board. That is because the regulatory decisions on tariffs, as well as um, the hearing of appeals and complaints in line with uh, sections 82 of the Act and section 41, and on appeals and complaints in line with section 46 and 47 of the National Ports Act, these decisions have to be taken by a collective of uh, members with the different uh, expertise that the chairperson alluded to in his introductory remark, remarks. As a result, then uh, for the 2019-20 uh, uh, financial year, uh, I've outlined this from 1st of April 2019 to the end of October 2019. The CEO performed the, for, the functions of the delegated accounting uh, authority. However, towards the end of October 2019, then the, an interim board was appointed by the minister 
and the membership was drawn from previous board members that had not uh, served more than uh, one term. And this was to allow them to be quickly acquainted with the tariff application of the authority and be able to apply themselves to the submissions that have been made, the tariff methodology, and to dispense a decision on the tariffs by end of uh, November 2019. That board uh, was appointed and served between 22 November 2019 and May, 20, uh, 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 May 2020. And it was comprised as highlighted in the uh, slide. They were able to achieve the following uh, in terms of the year under review, uh, constitute and appoint members to serve on audit and risk committee, the human resource and remuneration committee, as well as the regulatory uh, committee and uh, ensure that uh, from the time they were appointed, the committees uh, and, uh, dispense uh, their responsibilities. Uh, they were also able to appoint members to serve on hearing panels, and there were a number of um, matters that, were, that needed to be dealt with, which uh, were part of the backlog that even the current members are dealing with. Um, and to also appoint an independent chairperson and independent member to serve on the audit and risk committee to address some of the auditor general's finding at the time. They deliberated on and approved the published 2020-21 uh, uh, tariff decision and tariff book. Uh, at the same time, we had consulted extensively and um, uh, with the support of port users, finalized uh, the third multi-year tariff methodology, which uh, the members then approved and it was published, and the 2020-21 WIGO record of decision, as well as the uh, APP for 2020-21 and the strategic plan for that period. Now, if you go specifically into the performance of the organization uh, for 2019-20, the organization has five programs, administration, economic regulation, industry development, legal compliance and monitoring, as well as uh, governance. Uh, Chairperson, the next few slides outline each of the targets of the organization uh, that were set during the 2019-20 pe uh, performance period. And um, I will be guided by yourself whether you want us to go through each one of them. Uh, I think what is important is to note that the organization achieved all of the targets that were set in each of the programs for the year under review. And if I go to the last uh, slide, uh, this slide that summarizes uh, performance, uh, on each of the programs, um, uh, administration had five targets, all were achieved. Economic regulation had nine targets, all were achieved. Industry development had seven, uh, they were achieved. Uh, compliance, monitoring, and legal had five, they were achieved. And on tribunal, uh, in terms of the secretariat, uh, the one objective that was set was achieved. Accordingly, then the organization uh, had a 100% uh, achievement of its target for the year under review, uh, the 2019-20 uh, financial year. I'll just touch on key projects and achievement um, that, uh, that are covered in the slides that I ran through. Uh, the appointment of, of executive managers for industry development and policy and strategy uh, department were concluded during that financial year, uh, which had been a challenge in previous year where this po post uh, were vacant. Uh, the tariff uh, record of decision with below inflation and average fixed tariffs uh, were decided on by the regulator and the treatment of the National Ports Authority's regulatory asset base, which accounts for the entity's um, uh, uh, revenue, uh, revenue needs. Uh, on this particular uh, project, uh, Chairperson, the importance of the regulatory asset base is uh, that the, uh, the Ports Regulator set a methodology that um, talks to how the assets of the, or of the NPA will be, uh, 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 sorry, will be priced. And this methodology distinguishes between the assets of a 
NPA, which is a division of Transnet, and an NPA, which is corporatized in line with the National Ports Act. In summary, without going into the details, a corporatized NPA would have a higher reg regulatory asset base because we took into account the fact that as a, as a, as a, as a corporatized entity, it would have to raise uh, a, a revenue on its own in the market. However, if it continues to be a division under Transnet, then the regulatory asset base methodology uh, would result in lower uh, value for the regulatory asset base. And this is a matter that the then board and current board are, are, are managing uh, in the context of the broader discussion on corporatization of the NPA. We also did stick stakeholder feedback and inputs on the multi-year uh, tariff methodology as I've indicated, and this was accepted by players from industry, which included academics, um, uh, practitioners, uh, companies that are operating in the port space, the competition commission, um, and, and then other uh, role players. We publish an updated tariff strategy that reflects the revalued regulatory asset base under the two scenarios that I have alluded to just now and uh, implemented for the first time the results of the weighted efficiency gains from operations that saw the authority um, achieving a additional profits uh, because of improvements that were brought about by an intervention that they implemented to improve uh, the situation where vessels uh, are serviced as soon as they have been uh, given uh, the service time. Uh, assessment and review of the CAPEX program of the authority through our uh, consultation processes, we've sensitized uh, not only the NPA to the need to Im for implementing their CAPEX program, which is approved by the regulator, but also brought to the attention of port users who engages on the NPA processes through the port consultative committees, the extent to which the NPA CAPEX was underspent. And this has gained traction in the uh, port industry so that uh, port users are able to, together with the regulator, hold the authority accountable for the implementation of CAPEX or lack of implementation of CAPEX. We also submitted during the 2019-20 financial year a report to the Minister of Transport on Triple BEE based on Section 30, uh, Subsection 5 of the Act, which allows the regulator to submit to the Minister reports on uh, matters uh, uh, that needs his attention in the port uh, system. Uh, so those are the key projects and achievements for the 2019-20 uh, financial year. At this stage, I'll invite the chief financial officer to then uh, uh, take us through the performance of the organization in terms of uh, the finances, corporate services, and then conclude with the challenges uh, that the organization faced before we hand it back to yourself, chairperson, and the uh, members of the committee. Um, uh, Chogozani, uh, I can drive the presentation for you. You'll just indicate when you want to move on. Thank you, thank you, CEO. The, C the CFO can take over. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson. Afternoon, all the members of the committee, the Chairperson of the board, as well as uh, the CEO. Thanks a lot. Uh, CEO, please, uh, if you can just move into the next slide. Okay, so for the financial year under review, we had a surplus of uh, just above 11 million rent. One of the reasons for this was, um, as Joey did indicate earlier, that for the financial year 1924, more than eight months, we did not have the regulator members. So as a result, the, one of the things that we couldn't do was the tribunal function. In fact, we had to suspend the tribunal function at its entirety because with the absence of the regulator members, we could not exercise that function. So a lot of activities, for example, the, the board oversight meetings, those could not be done. Uh, and also we're anticipating that the Department of Transport 
would appoint the new regulator members for that fund. We will need to do some extensive training in our core, very unique business processes. So all those um, budgeted for items could not be done in 1920. That as a result uh, ended up for us having a huge surplus of uh, uh, just above 11 million rand. And further to that, there was a delay as Joe indicated that uh, the appointment of the executive uh, managers for industry development as well as um, regulation, those also were delayed uh, because of the absence of the re uh, regulator members. So there's quite a number of activities members that uh, we, um, we could not do in that financial year as a result of the absence of the board members of which the jurisdiction for the appointment of the board members rests with the Minister of Transport. So we were very excited when the members interim board was appointed in November, but they were only there for a few months and uh, some of the functions could not be done successfully. So most of the things were due to that fact. Okay, with regards to the budget uh, for the medium term, as going to be presented today by the Minister of Finance, uh, as Joey did highlight earlier, that when it comes to the regulator, most of our decisions, um, rather, most of our outputs is made of decisions. So therefore, that's the reason why, if you look at our budget, uh, more than more of our expenditure goes to compensation of employees, because employees are the main asset of the organization when it comes to delivery of the annual performance plan. So with regards to the programs, Joey did highlight the performance on those programs. And obviously ex um, administration is for the main running of the entity and legal services has a higher budget because the new board is appointed by the minister effective June, 2020. The new board has prioritized the reduction of the tribunal backlog since this program was suspended for more than a year. So therefore the new board then took a decision that this must be prioritized to make sure that all tribunal cases are resolved and closed off. So that's the main reason why that there is a, quite a higher budget that is being put aside for the legal services. So the, the main issue just to highlight here, the members is that um, for the organization going forward, we plan to you know, have very high regard in, in terms of um, uh, having more employees uh, on board to make sure that we can really achieve our mandate. Next slide, Joey. With regards to uh, audits for the financial years um, in the past, I think can be seen that um, we had a very disciplined expenditure uh, when it comes to the audits. However, in 18, 19, and 1920 financial year, there was a regression and we received uh, unqualified uh, audit opinions from the AG. And that was as a result of uh, non-compliance with the procurement legislation. Next slide, Joey. So with regards to the 1819 and 1920 financial year, there was irregular expenditure in CAD of 1.4 for 1819 and 921 for 1920. So the main reasons for this um, non-compliance was with regards to the deviations that the AG, when they assessed the transactions, the AG was of the opinion that the deviations in terms of the thresholds, they should have been approved by Treasury of which uh, at the time management viewed as this can be approved by management. And secondly, this was also related to the uh, declaration of interest forms uh, of which was raised in 1819 and 1920. So it was it had a knock-on effect for the financial year of 1920 when it was initially raised in 1819. So the findings from the AG then obviously um, as the management there to put in place measures to make sure that this don't okay going forward in future. Uh, therefore, we had to then prepare an audit outcomes action plan, which then is monitored by the audit and risk committee to make sure that these findings do not okay again in future. So the audit committee then does monitor this pro the progress on the implementation of corrective measures to make sure that um, there's compliance with the procurement legislation. So the, the organization, therefore, in terms of the requirements of the irregular expenditure framework, that they had to conduct a test to confirm that there was um, no corruption that took place on the irregular expenditure, that the entity did receive value for money on these transactions, and that um, uh, there, was a there was no uh, financial loss 
been suffered by the entity. So this assessment was done by the internal audit, which is outsourced. And there was confirmation that the transactions uh, did not result in any corruption and there was no financial loss and there was value for money. However, there was a need in terms of the framework that somebody must be held accountable for incurring this irregular expenditure. The report that came from the internal audit has indicated that the CFO is a person who must be held accountable for this irregular expenditure. And then there was um, action taken against the CFO by the former CEO. And after that, a letter was written to National Treasury for condonation of irregular expenditure for both 18, 19, and 1920. And I can confirm that National Treasury did reply and condoned the irregular expenditure for both financial years of 1819 and 1920. And this has been communicated to both the, the, the board as well as the auditor general. Next slide, Joey. <clears throat> uh, members, the post regulator in terms of sections, uh, section 40, subsection one of the National Ports Act, we are financed by the transfers from the fiscals. As we all are aware that there's a, a pressure on the fiscals, therefore the transfer to a regulator also uh, become severely affected. So as a result of that, then there was a need for us to find alternative ways to augment our financing. That is when as a regulator, we developed what we call a funding model, where we wanted to adopt a similar approach that is applied by other regulators, being ICASA for communications, as well as NASA for ESCOM, et cetera. So we developed a funding model, which we have uh, presented to the Portfolio Committee on Transport, the ministry and other engagements where we explained that this model when it is implemented, uh, is gonna be a hybrid model where we can charge a regulated fee of about 0.5 to 0.7% to the regulated entity well, like a small piece of a pie that will be used where the users or rather the stakeholders in the maritime sector will then have to finance the operations of the regulator and to make sure that it can be sustainable as this is approach that is being used by other regulators in this country. So <clears throat> this funding model will obviously require the National Post Act to be amended to make sure that this can be incorporated and implemented. However, the Department of Transport did consider our application. And uh, last year, it was communicated to us that uh, the department wants to introduce what we call a maritime development fund, where amongst other initiatives would be to incorporate the amendments to finance the post regulator. So unfortunately, at this point in time, the amendments of the National Port Act relating to this funding model are on hold because the department wants to proceed with the Maritime Development Fund initiative. Therefore, the STAIR, which is the single transport economic regulator, is now prioritized, which according to the Department of Transport's business plan, is prioritized for March 2022 to be signed off by the president. So at this point, members, we're hoping and, and uh, relying that the department will ensure that they can uh, fast track the ERT bill to be passed to all parliament processes and approved and signed into law, where we as a post regulator will be the nucleus of the state. And then we will we'll then expect more funding to be made available to the post regulator through the transfers from the fiscals, as well as a new funding model where we will charge a fee to all the regulated entities in the new established um, economic regulator bill. So at this point, um, the, the budget that I just presented did. That one is only purely on the current format of the National Post Act, where we only finance by the transfers from the fiscals. The challenge we have, members, as well, is that in terms of the different programs that we have, we only have about um, four people in each organization. <clears throat> so therefore, we need to really increase the, the number of employees in all those um, uh, different uh, departments. Therefore, the additional funding will assist us in that regard. Right, next slide, Joey. <clears throat> so one of the plans that we have in order to build capacity for the uh, coming stem is to increase the current capacity at the post circulator. 
At the moment, the current organogram only has a total of 27 positions. And out of those 27 positions, only three of them are vacant and not funded. <clears throat> At this point, we busy with the recruitment process to which we hope that by the end of March, we can fill um, the, uh, the position in the organogram. Uh, the national process requires the Minister of Transport to approve all the, the changes in the organogram, obviously with the concurrence of the Minister of Transport, uh, who should then confirm that additional funding will be uh, made available to the post circulator to assist us to appoint more employees on the new revised organogram. In terms of the new organogram, we hope we are planning to expand from 27 positions to a total of 60 positions. The post circulator is of the opinion that by us expanding into six positions, we'll, bet, we'll be able to better capacitate ourselves to prepare for this day, as we all, all aware that this day will, um, will try to rather regulate other modes of transport, being aviation, road, uh, et cetera. So we need to make sure that when we move into stay, we have enough human body to make sure that there's expansion on the uh, modes as well. So we have submitted this revised organogram to the Ministry of Transport and we're hoping that approval can be sought soon. And then we can um, also have additional funding and we can start to fill additional positions. When it comes to Truth BE Women and Youth Empowerment, we did meet our target of 75% uh, discretionary expenditure from suppliers with B rating of two. And when it comes to the staff complement for the financial year ending in March 2020, with a total of 21 uh, employees, and of those 21, 13 of them uh, were women. So that then represents a total of 61% women when it comes to the post circulator. So unfortunately at the post circulator, we haven't really developed programs that are directly aimed at uh, youth supply and women empowerment due to the nature of the organization and the funding we have. Members, I want to emphasize upon that when it comes to the expenditure on goods and services is very limited and it makes it difficult for us to put aside uh, any funding to say this one is specifically designed for such an initiative. And we're hoping that uh, going forward, this is one area that when we have more funding available, we can set aside funding to assist those uh, programs of youth as well as the supply and women empowerment uh, to make sure that we can um, really expand on the true BE uh, space. However, I want to note that when the tariff assessments uh, are done, it is taken into account the issue of women youth empowerment in, in, in our assessment of the tariff uh, by the post circulator. And also in terms of our procurement, we always uh, make sure that uh, there's an element of uh, women as well as youth empowerment on our procurement processes. One of our job as a post circulator is to do an uh, be assessment of the licenses and contracts in the port sector. And then we obviously report on that into the minister where we've done that analysis. And then we ensure that in the port sector, the policy department is aware of how to be is being implemented. And also what intervention needs to be done to make sure that we can transform the maritime sector in terms of, of the charter and the codes. Uh, next slide, Joey. In terms of the employment equity at the regulator, uh, as I did indicate earlier on, that 63% uh, of them was a uh, woman and uh, 38 being a male. And in terms of um, race, 89% uh, was black and only 11% was white. And on the, on the age gaps, uh, more than six, just above 62%. Uh,
workshop that will meet our target for the financial year. Next slide, Joey. <clears throat> With regards to assistance on bursaries, scholarships, and internships, unfortunately for the financial year 1920, we did not award any bursaries due to the financial constraints. However, every year the regulator does offer financial assistance to employees to further their studies. This relates to short-term courses being three months, half year, or one year course. So every year we prepare a training plan, which we submit to TITA in April. And then we HR ensures that we monitor the plan and all the plans as set in April does take place during the year. And then the post collector funds the training uh, to ensure that we can in, um, uh, possibly upskill our that can be assisted to deliver on the mandates of the ports regulator. Next slide, Joey. <clears throat> so when it comes to the challenges of post regulator, as I did highlight earlier on that the current funding is not sufficient for us to expand our mandates. As I explained that we have um, revised our economic program from 27 positions to 60. Obviously we will need more funding for us to, uh, to implement the revised economic program and appoint more employees so that we can be able to be better capacitated as we prepare to be the nucleus of the stay so that when the stay is implemented, uh, hopefully in the next financial year, at that time we'll be in the new organogram and we'll have more additional funding. So this is one area that we will need the committee to assist us to make sure that the department does approve our revised organogram. And secondly, there is um, an increase on, on the allocation to the post regulator so that we can really assist the department to achieve the policy of implementing the single transport economic regulator. There is a need, obviously, to strengthen the post regulator with regards to the self funding model that will reduce the, the reliance on the fiscals. As again, we're all aware at the moment that the fiscals is under severe pressure, there's no additional funding available. Therefore, if the National Post Act is amended to allow the post regulator to charge a fee to the regulated entity, this will really go a long way to assist us to, to generate more funding, which will then make sure that the, the, the reliance on us on the fiscal will be reduced. So the single transport economic regulator bill will obviously try to ensure that this area is uh, mitigated by allowing us when we establish into a stay to charge this regulated fee. Therefore, it is utmost important that the checking of the state bill is monitored to ensure that it is approved as soon as possible and implemented correctly. Now, the funding model that we spoke about earlier on obviously required um, the National Post Act to be uh, amended, of which at this point in time, that is put on hold, as I explained that the Department of Transport to implement the Maritime Development Fund Initiative. <clears throat> so by putting back the National Post Act amendments, therefore we, we, we therefore ask the, the, the committee to ensure that the department is, is put to account to push very far uh, and very fast on the approval of the STEM bill. With regards to the capacity of the organization, a total of um, 21 positions um, have been filled for the 1920 financial year. And really, members, if you look at the TNPA, it's a very big entity and only have that number of employees available to regulate such a big entity. That is, in a sense, uh, shooting yourself in the foot. Therefore, it's very important that we do not set the regulator for a failure, but rather we capacitate the regulator to have all the employees required to be able to run, rather render a better service to the maritime sector. A lot of regulators in the country, uh, I mean, you would find that they will have just one department having 15 or 20 employees. But for, ha for us here, the post regulator, there's a total organization. Therefore, there needs to be just a rationale that is said to say the regulators must be capacitated to make sure that they can really assist the government to achieve their strategic objectives. Also, the challenge that we faced in 1920 financial year was the absence of the regulator or, or rather called the board members. As I did mention that uh, 
1920 financial year, we had to suspend the tribunal function, of which is very important because it assists us to ensure that the TNPA is held to account. So, excuse me. By the absence of the tribunal, one of the of the contributions was that number one, it led to material underspending of the budget, and also all the plans that we had put in place for the tribunal uh, could not be done in the financial year. Therefore, that meant that as a post regulator, we did not fulfill one of our um, objectives as put on the act. Therefore, this is one area that we need to ensure that at this point in time, since we do have the regulator members, main reason for them to prioritize the tribunal is to ensure that all those long outstanding tribunal cases can be resolved and the decision issued and the case can be closed. Again, lastly, on the challenges members that we faced uh, in March 2020 was the issue about the contract, uh, employment contract of the CEO, which had expired in uh, 20, April 2019. The then Minister, uh, Honorable Zimande, did extend the contract for uh, one year, uh, ending uh, October 2019. And then the Honorable Minister Mbalula extended the contract again for another year until October 2020. Obviously, when it comes to uh, good governance and the uh, sustainability of the entity, this was not an ideal situation. So therefore, when the new board came, was appointed uh, last year, June, the new board then uh, prioritized the, the issue of appointment of the new CEO, which was successful, as uh, we did report that our CEO, Ms. Joy Molawuzi, was appointed as um, effective one January by the Minister of Transport, as required by the National Ports Act. Next slide, Joey. So members, I would like to stop here and we will welcome questions of clarity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, CEO. Thank you, uh, CFO. Can you take down the, the presentation? Thank you, thank you, thank you, honorable uh, members. That is the, the presentation from uh, from the CEO and the CFO, as led by the chairperson of the board. Uh, is there anyone from the Department of Transport? Uh, uh, maybe just to make some reflection in terms of the challenges raised by, by the regulator. Thank you, Chairperson. This is uh, Zakele Twala. Yeah, Zakele, can Zakele show his face? Uh, I've played the video, so I don't know what's happening. Okay, get okay. Mr. Twala, and then you can proceed. Chair. With, with respect to the issues of funding, uh, the department, that's not that here. The department has uh, put back the, the baseline to which, which the regulator asked for, one. Two, in terms of the CEO and the appointments, the department has now have, has a, a, a substantive CEO and also a fully complemented board. If there are other challenges, then I can respond to them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Twana. Uh, honorable members, that is the presentation. Can we have uh, engagements? Uh, customer as we do, I've noted uh, honorable team. Uh, uh, Honorable Chai, and then Honorable Boshoff. Uh, let's, 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 let's start in that fashion. Honorable Tim Bratuset, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'm sorry, my signal here is, <clears throat> is, uh, is unusually slow because we have electricity issues in our area. Um, 
so I will not turn my camera on if that's okay. But I just have some very quick inquiries, Chair. Um, I noted that <clears throat> in the media that there'd been some pressure from Transnet Ports Authority on, on the regulator last year to increase uh, the tariffs by 19.74%. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to hear and read that those, those attempts were, <clears throat> were, were set back by the regulator because it, it falls into the, the idea of trying to limit the costs of doing business uh, for, for port operators. And we all welcome that. I'd just like to get the regulators input with, with the budget speech today and with obviously an increasingly tightened fiscal uh, environment. Does the regulator expect to once again be pressured by Transnet to raise tariffs? Um, and have there been any conversations in that regard? If, if, uh, if the regulator could just comment on that environment. Then the next question is, and it's one that we raise often, Chair, does the regulator who falls under transport feel that Transnet as well should be transferred back to fall under the Department of Transport, where whether that would create more synergy in the Department of, of a regulator and a Department of Transport working with an entity such as Transnet, which is located outside of the department. Uh, where, where does the regulator feel the home of Transnet should be? Um, and then finally, can the regulator just comment on, if, if the regulator can, on the perceived backlog in ports um, that has been reported to me from around the country from the various ports that there seems to be a lot of queuing of ships to come into the ports um, is, is that as a result of, of COVID lockdowns or can they comment on the perceived lockdown uh, or not lockdown uh, backlog in ports and maybe the congestion of ports in South Africa? Thank you, Chair. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Patterson. Honorable Chai. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And uh, also thanks to the, the person of the board. Uh, the CEO and the uh, CFO. <clears throat> Chair, I just want to start with the with the AG uh, comments. Uh, I know that the, the CFO has taken us through uh, the report of the AG, but if you look at the <clears throat> at the report uh, with regard to procurement and contract management. Uh, AG says uh, goods and services uh, of a transaction value above 500,000 was procured without inviting competitive bids and the deviation was approved by the accounting officer without obtaining prior written approval from the relevant treasurer. So the question is the why did that happen? Um, but also with regard to the consequence management, uh, uh, the AGSA I was unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence that disciplinary steps were taken against the officials. I uh, hear the report says that the, the uh, disciplinary steps were taken uh, against the CFO, uh, but uh, what the report doesn't say is uh, what kind of sanction uh, was the sanction equal to the to the misconduct? Um, but also the <clears throat> report uh, also blames uh, the the leadership uh, of the institution with regard to uh, in con uh, internal control deficiencies. Um, there's a section that says leadership did not exercise adequate oversight or non-compliance with the laws and regulation relating to consequence management and procurement uh, and, and contract uh, uh, management. Uh, so those are the, the, the issues that are relating uh, to the uh, AG's uh, report. Um, Chair, <clears throat> we, uh, the, there's also been a rating of uh, uh, the NDT uh, if uh, um, we could get uh, comments, uh, the rating were around the efficiency, effectiveness, uh, responsiveness, 
neutrality, independence, and decision. Uh, I see that uh, there was a regression with regard to the efficiency and effectiveness um, in terms of the rating. Uh, I think that the, there's positive uh, a rating with regard to responsiveness and neutrality, uh, independence. Um, but but uh, there's a regression with regard to efficiency, uh, effectiveness, uh, yeah, and so forth. And then to, <clears throat> with regard to funding of the regulator, uh, the CFO mentioned the fact that they get the grant from government, uh, but also in their statement, it says uh, they also get uh, uh, funding from uh, the interest. Um, but also, if you look at the APP, it says also the, the fees uh, that uh, come from filing of complaints or appeals. But in the, in the financial statement that the, the, the fees uh, in, t in terms of the income uh, for filing of uh, complaints or appeal uh, doesn't uh, appear uh, uh, in, the, in the statement. Um, my my other question also perhaps related to to the investigations or the appeals uh, as to how many uh, appeals or complaints uh, that uh, the NDT has uh, has received, uh, but also if there are any complaints uh, against the authority, and uh, how has the regulator dealt with those uh, 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 complaints. <clears throat> Chair, on uh, corporate management, I see that uh, the the NDT has just uh, 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 clustered uh, the, the performance uh, uh, indicators um, around the, the adoption of policies. And, and it gives us a, a challenge with regard to know exactly how then you break down those uh, 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 those uh, uh, performance areas because they, they are clustered in terms of IT, HR, uh, finance, without being broken down as to on finance, what were the targets, on uh, uh, ICT, what were the targets, on uh, um, HR, uh, what are the targets? For example, it's not clear, whilst we appreciate that uh, there are about 13 women, uh, I think out of 27 employees, but it doesn't tell us uh, how many women are in the senior management uh, uh, structure, uh, but also it doesn't tell us about uh, um, employees uh, with disabilities, uh, whether the, the government target of the 3% has been achieved by the NDT or not. So it, it, it doesn't, it just says all the policies around HR have been adopted, uh, but it doesn't clearly tell us uh, in each of those policies, what are the key performance areas, uh, as well as uh, on ICT management or communication strategy. Uh, there are no uh, key indicators uh, that are, are, are stipulated as well as the declaration with regard to the conflict of interests uh, by the, the senior managers, whether there has been any declarations uh, that have been signed, as well as the, the, the vacancy rate uh, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in, in the NDT, whether uh, the 10% the, the government uh, uh, threshold uh, uh, has been met. Uh, so, so far, uh, those are the uh, questions I, I would like uh, uh, responses to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Hai, Honorable Boshoff. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the majority of questions have been asked, but I would just like to know, um, Honorable Hai touched on the 27 positions that they want to increase to 60. Um, in light of the financial situation that Raul Bosch of Raul 
Basha, you're not audible enough. We can't hear you. Okay, let me move closer. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Do you want me to start you. right from the beginning? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, the 27 positions that they want to increase to 60. I understand why, because um, of the magnitude of the work that has to be done. But in the financial position that we find ourselves in, would they say that it is going to be feasible? If they think it is feasible, have they followed up on getting the approval from the minister? Um, do they do anything to capacitate the youth to allow them to be able to apply for any positions within their entities? Um, I also had problems with the disabilities because we don't see anything um, referring to people with disabilities. And then um, I also see that with regard to the employment, it's 89 to 11% black to white. But what about the other races, the coloreds and our Indians? Um, we have to reach out to them as well. And then they spoke of staff members that had benefited from further studies. Could they indicate how many staff members benefited and what the cost to company was? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Washoff. Honorable Aplani? No, I have been covered, uh, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Aplani. Uh, thank you. Uh, Honorable Mushori. Yes, Honorable Mushori. Thank you very much, Thanks, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, most of the question was asked by Honorable Chai, Honorable Chair. Save to ask maybe one question from the chairperson of the board. I just want to check on the issue of gender parity amongst these nine members of the board. How many women are represented? Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Mushori. Can we have uh, the committee secretary, uh, Honorable Matebula? Can we have the committee secretary reading the questions from uh, Honorable Matebula? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, the question reads as follows. What the department plan in enforcing gender equality in the workplace, especially in the appointment of entry board as it is dominated by males? What's the regulated plan in advocating and promoting for intercontinental service imports on the the next question, on the three vacant positions that are not funded, what are going to do about it? Your presentation talked about youth, women, and it says nothing about regarding the people living with disability. Can the red grader explain why? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Fikada. Just, just uh, one from my I think let's say two. There's a at the beginning of your presentation uh, under the the uh, the uh, outcomes in alignment with the nation. Uh, there is a referral to to. Uh, space under transformation, which captures the submission of a comprehensive report on the port sector, uh, B to the minister uh, uh, for the maritime transport and civil sector. It will be important just to get uh, the, the thrust of uh, what, of what this uh, uh, a report entails uh, so that at least uh, as the committee we are taking on board. Uh, the second one relates to the uh, to 
to the uh, point raised around, uh, uh, I think it's the rental leases. Uh, it's, it's one of the of, of your indicators, which uh, speaks to the to the uh, uh, rental leases, uh, which uh, it will be important just to get a sense in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the the uh, the work uh, that is being done. Uh, I'm raising this point informed by the fact that uh, uh, with regard to to rail. Uh, with regard to rail, there's always been a challenge uh, with uh, regard to the emerging uh, mining players' access to, to rail because it is dominated by mainly two major players. So as one of your indicators, you talk about the risk profile of the NPA created and analyzed, and, it's, and the, it says that the uh, you analyze the terminal leases of the NPA and assess the rental profile with regards to price, duration, and cost. Uh, this is very important just to get a sense as to uh, what is the situation with regard to access to the ports. Uh, is the same situation uh, like it, it prevails in the, uh, with regard to the access to rail. Uh, is there the same challenge with regard to access to, to ports? How do you deal with this? And that can only be done if you give us just a, a brief reflection in terms of uh, the, the profile around your, 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 your leases, uh, so that at least we get a sense as to whether uh, is there anything that can be done to make that intervention as indeed access. Over to you, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, and to the uh, honorable members of the committee. I'm going to ask uh, 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 the CEO to uh, respond uh, to the questions that, uh, that 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 have been that have been raised by by the members uh, in in the context of this session. Uh, CEO, over to you, please. All right. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, just like we shared the presentation. I will deal with the, the, some of the questions and ask the uh, CFO to add. Um, and I, I've, I've taken the questions down uh, per member. Uh, and uh, if I have uh, maybe missed uh, some, then you will remind me. Um, I think starting with Honorable Member uh, Tim. Um, the uh, question you asked around the whether the regulator expects that Transnet uh, would put pressure on the uh, regulator in terms of its tariff application uh, for that is due in August 2020 um, uh, for, for, for increased uh, tariffs. Uh, I think we need to outline that the tariff methodology that uh, I referred to set the framework that guides the authority on how it should apply for the required uh, revenue uh, from the ports uh, regulator. And uh, the 19.74% that they applied for in the previous financial year uh, was based on their interpretation and application of the tariff methodology. However, the regulator's decision was based on um, not only the tariff methodology, but taking into account, as the chairperson has indicated, uh, prevailing economic conditions, how we are to respond to the pandemic, as well as um, the application of the savings uh, kitty that I spoke about, which is the ETIMC, to ensure that where they rightfully needed to get higher tariff increases, we can use the ETIMC to reduce uh, those uh, tariff, um, uh, the tariffs. The expectation uh, therefore is um, 
that they will put in a, an application that takes into account the effect of COVID on, the, uh, on their ability to raise revenue during this financial year. And uh, following what I've just outlined, the regulator should be able to, in applying the methodology as well as the ETIMC, come to a decision that is um, a, a in line with the, its adopted position where by and large the tariffs must be uh, a, under inflation. On whether the regulator wants Transnet to be under the Department of uh, Transport, uh, Chairperson, I see that we do have representative from the Department of Transport uh, who, who are better placed to respond to the policy uh, questions. As a regulator, we are a creature of statute and we implement the decisions that are taken by the state. In so far as this question is concerned, I think I, I will attempt to respond to it by saying that the location of uh, NPA within Transnet and the need for it to be corporatized is a policy decision that the uh, government has taken, which is reflected in the Commercial Ports Policy of 2002, as well as the National Ports Act of 2005. As members would know, this has not been fully implemented and it would be easier for the regulator to undertake its work uh, with a NPA that is um, a, 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 a subsidiary uh, of Transnet as opposed to a division of uh, Transnet. So the regulator is uh, supporting the department with technical work to ensure that the authority is accordingly uh, uh, corporatized, but the location of transport, Transnet this, uh, between the Department of Transport and the Department of Public Enterprise is a matter that I think uh, would be responded to by the Department of uh, uh, Transport. On the uh, regulator's view regarding the backlog in court, uh, the congestion that is caused, we have uh, instituted uh, bilateral meetings with the National Post Authority so that the authority reports to the regulator on a regular basis about uh, the situation at port uh, as affected by COVID and generally their performance. And uh, they have, um, in that context, we understand that the congestion uh, during COVID uh, affected a lot of the port of Cape Town uh, a, as well as the port of Deben more than the other ports, and that also, uh, and sorry, and the ports in the Eastern Cape because of the higher levels of infection rates in those respective uh, coastal and uh, uh, towns. They have implemented measures uh, to address the congestion. And in our participation at port consultative committees where port users provide feedback on how the authority is handling matters at port uh, in, this, in the current round that has just uh, ended. In the respective port, uh, users have appreciated that although there was a slow uh, start uh, in terms of responses from the authority, ultimately they were happy with how the, uh, with, with how the authority has responded to the congestion and addressed the congestion. We should also highlight that uh, some of the congestion, as the member has rightfully said, is perceived in that there are vessels that seek shelter in our encourage. And when we view them, we see that as congestion. However, those vessels are not um, uh, waiting to be serviced in our ports. They may be waiting for orders. Uh, and, and so on. In terms of the question around the uh, auditor general uh, comments, I will ask the, uh, to the, 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 the CFO to address those. And that is in terms of the uh, deviation on uh, procurement of, uh, value, of uh, a value above 500,000 and why, what, why approval was not sought from uh, National Treasury, as well as the question around uh, consequence management and um, uh, 
the funding from interest and fees, uh, how it is reflected in the financial statement. Um, I will respond to the questions from member uh, Hai in relation to uh, the regression on the rating of the regulator. This is covered in our annual report where we've highlighted that by and large, the feedback that we've received from port users through the uh, surveys that they complete and submit back to the regulator shows that there is high, a high level um, of, of, of approval of the work of the regulator, which is why on average, the rating over the six year period has been 80% um, uh, uh, and above, which is considered to be a, a good rating uh, for any organization. Uh, we undertake this surveys in order that our stakeholder engagement program is addressed by an understanding of the issues that port users raise and where they want us to focus our attention. And um, in this regard, I think the uh, rating, the, 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 the area that received a lower rating than the others is on the responsiveness of the ports regulator. And as we've highlighted in the presentation, the fact that we did not have members of the board uh, and therefore could not Uh, arrived at a settlement with the authority. So, uh, and then on the question around, uh, a, a, a member highest question around um, the provision of uh, a breakdown on the administration program in terms of how we have reported uh, it, Person, we will take that as uh, a, a, a something that we need to uh, look into and in future uh, reporting ensure that we, uh, we, we provide uh, that uh, uh, breakdown. Uh, he raised questions around breakdown of uh, breakdown in terms of um, uh, our vacancy rate versus, uh, as an example, versus uh, the 10% uh, government uh, threshold. Uh, on this particular one, our vacancy, we have an approved uh, structure or organogram of uh, 27 posts, of which uh, 22 are funded. And out of those uh, funded uh, positions, we have filled the vacancies or endeavor to fill the vacancies as soon as um, they arose. Uh, so we will we, we we will have challenges in the future, as the C CFO has highlighted. Our challenges are that the capacity itself is not sufficient for us to address uh, the, the 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 mandate of the regulator. Um, and then, uh, I think, Chairperson, if you allow me, I will I will deal with the questions from all the members and then ask the CFO to address the one the specific ones that I've highlighted for him to address. On uh, member, we have, we have, we have the here. thank you, Chairperson. I'm saying, I'm saying um, that you can proceed in that fashion. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Member Boshoff, uh, the 27 uh, position that we have proposed should be expanded to 60. And uh, you asked whether the financial situation uh, that the country is under, specifically the uh, fiscals, is it uh, feasible uh, that these positions will be filled? Uh, we are engaging with the Department of Transport 
and through that engagement, uh, a determination will be made as to given the current funding situation, uh, how many of the additional posts can be filled. What is clear from the regulator's side is that the situation that we are under is uh, become, becoming untenable in that uh, you have a corporate services uh, department, as an example, that comprises the chief financial officer who also doubles up as the corporate services manager. You have, he is supported by a specialist that is responsible for HR, supply chain management, as well as IT. And then there's a, a and the, 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 there are two people that provide our general support. This flies in the face of even the recommendations by National Treasury in terms of a fully functional financial management uh, department. And uh, these are the positions that we would want to prioritize, even given the current uh, financial situation. The CFO has highlighted that the um, surpluses that uh, have been um, and surpluses that uh, we've applied uh, for retention with the National Treasury. And the uh, uh, plan is that when those surpluses are um, uh, approved, one, if they are approved, one, two, uh, if the Minister of Transport approves the organogram, expanded organogram as uh, submitted or a, 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 some of those posts as, 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 as uh, highlighted, we should be able to fill uh, the, the priority positions that are necessary for the organization. On the question of capacitating youth, uh, sorry, you also asked if we are doing any follow up on this. And the answer is in the affirmative. Um, we had a session with uh, Mr. Um, Zakele, who is in this meeting from the Department of Transport, and they have assured us that they are following up on this and we will be getting feedback from the department uh, on progress regarding the, 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 the uh, proposed organogram. In terms of capacitation of youth to apply for positions in the organization, from the, time, from the inception of the regulator, the capacity has actually mainly been built from within. Uh, if you look at the specialists that we have now that we heavily rely on, uh, almost all of them uh, came in as intents. What the regulator got right at the beginning was to structure an internship program slightly different from the one that government departments run, where young people are identified from universities. They are given a three-year internship uh, opportunity, which uh, remunerates slightly higher than uh, normal internships. And we've been able to absorb them into the organization. The last absorption happened uh, in the, at the end of the 2020 financial year, where we had uh, two intents that effective 1st April uh, 2020, having gone through due process, they have now been absorbed into the organization. As and where feasible, we do identify intents and train them up and, they, and uh, where the opportunity presents, they are then uh, absorbed into the organization or they compete uh, through the recruitment process and they've been able to uh, succeed because they've had the exposure to the organization. The question on disability, which was raised by uh, member Boshoff and uh, I think another member of uh, what was in the chat, um, we have to accept that we have not uh, developed a program that identifies and uh, bring people with uh, disabilities into the institution. That is an area that we need to uh, pay attention to. However, when we do advertise, uh, our adverts uh, uh, indicate that we will welcome applications from people with disabilities. And the building that we occupy, uh, occupy in Etequini uh, uh, is uh, disability uh, friendly. 
On the breakdown for race uh, in terms of the category of black, I think uh, that includes um, um, a, a colored people as well as uh, Indian. And in terms of the actual numbers, I would ask the CFO to also assist in providing uh, such. Um, the question on gender parity in the board, uh, which was asked by member uh, uh, Lydia, sorry, I, I, I did not write down your, your last name. Um, I know it was addressed to the chairperson of the board, and if the chairperson allows, I can um, uh, proffer an explanation, and then he can uh, uh, perhaps add on that. The, the uh, interim board, uh, for the period under review, which was 2019-20. As I indicated, it was important that because they were going to be appointed when there was limited time left in the uh, program of the regulator in terms of approval of tariffs, it had to be members that were familiar with the work of the regulator and members that had served only one term. And that is what resulted in the uh, uh, profile of the uh, board that you see in the annual report. I will also, I can indicate a, a, a member that in terms of the board that was appointed by the minister in, 20, in June of 2020, um, including now the, 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 the CEO as ex officio member of the board, Six of the members, um, a, 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 which are uh, 10, are women. So the organization is, um, uh, um, or at least through the appointments by the Minister of Transport, the issue of gender parity is being addressed uh, in the, at board level uh, for the ports regulator. And as the CFO has presented, uh, in terms of the staff complement, we have uh, more women uh, at the port regulator. The new appointments that have been made in this financial year, we have appointed two new uh, senior managers, both of which are women. The, uh, two, uh, the, the staff members that are expected to start on the 1st of April, uh, uh, which is uh, three, um, uh, where the two positions have been filled, one of those is by a, a, a female uh, candidate. On the question around a, a, a chairperson, the outcomes of the regulator that are in alignment with the government objectives, uh, you have requested to have an appreciation of what is covered in the uh, Section 35 report uh, to the Minister of Transport in relation to transformation in the port sector. Uh, I think uh, through your processes, we, we can make available the copy of the report, but effectively the regulations were adopted in 2009. From a capacity point of view, the regulator was only able in 2017, 18, uh, to start a, with the actual project to determine the level of triple B E E compliance or to quantify triple B E compliance in the port system across the different activities that the authority is responsible for. So the responsible uh, the authority has to contract with terminal operators, and there are about 90 of those in the port system. Uh, commercial leases and licenses, they, uh, uh, they are over uh, 600 of those uh, in the system. And then um, activities that they license for diving, for bunkering, for stevedoring, and so on. So our report focused on mainly terminal operators, uh, the commercial leases and licenses that were entered into uh, during the financial year 17 and 18, and then the port activities that I have outlined. The overall finding is that they there are variable le levels of uh, transformation in the system. If you look at terminal operations where uh, uh, companies that have to participate in that space require, are required to have capital, know-how, and so on. 
the levels of participation by uh, a, a triple, B, a triple BEE empowered companies, uh, companies with a level of uh, black ownership, uh, women and um, uh, uh, women ownership or, or, uh, and management are very low. However, in the space of, uh, com of licensing for uh, port activities uh, around a, 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 a bunkering and the provision of uh, services in the port space, they are over time, they are, there's improvement in terms of uh, transformation. If you use the proxy uh, of uh, black ownership and women participation, However, across the board, we are not doing well as a port system in terms of 51% uh, ownership uh, or, or participation by companies with 51% black ownership, 30% women uh, ownership, and so on. And part of uh, the challenge, which is reflected in the report, is the outdated regulations, number one, and the absence of a uh, a, a private sector participation framework that also defines what needs to be happening to open the spaces for uh, a, to a black companies, small companies in the port space. In the tariff decision that the regulator published in uh, November 2020, we had we had wanted to actually target the interventions or the incentives or responses to COVID-19, not only to SMMEs, but also black uh, owned companies within that category. And the challenge that uh, exists at a, as a, at a legislative level was the decision of the uh, SCA, which was delivered in November, 2020, which nullified the triple PFA regulations of 2017 that we're beginning to allow entities to target uh, a, 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 and, and pre-qualify uh, black QSEs and EMEs. However, through the interactions with the Triple BEE Commission, it has become clear that the NPA, which is the entity consent here, should be applying to the Minister of Trade and Industry to activate section nine of the triple BEE Act, which allows public entities to apply for a deviation from normal supply chain to address particular objectives of which transform transformation would be one. On the question of rental and leases, uh, the project as reflected under the 2019-20 financial year, reflects the beginning of the process by the port regulator to open up the space. Uh, because of the capacity constraints that we've had, we've not been able to, up, uh, to, 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 to have projects that address the full mandate of the regulator. And this is an area that we are now going into to first understand the full uh, uh, universe of the leases in the port space. As I've indicated, commercial leases and licenses amount to over 600 agreements that we will have to go through. Uh, during the year under review, we were looking at a high level what is happening in that space, and we have a report on that. It is only in this financial year uh, that we will be reporting on the full analysis of the leases and the licenses in the port space. Having said that, Chairperson, I should hasten to say that in terms of our oversight on the Ports Authority and based on the triple BEE analysis that we have done, we have required the authority to submit to the regulator their transformation strategy, which includes how they are using the expiry of licenses in the port space to address transformation. If you look at the, as an example, the um, Island View precinct, which is the liquid bulk precinct in the port of Deben, the uh, contracts there, are, the leases there are running on a month to month basis. And that is because they had to ensure that they address transformation with the renewal of the licenses um, uh, and in, in, in that space. So the project that we are undertaking 
would assist the regulator to have a, a full view of what is happening with the rent, in the rental space uh, space and um, and with transformation on that. And it is a project that we will be happy to uh, report uh, in further engagement or future engagements with the committee and would have uh, uh, more details uh, to share uh, with the committee. Um, I think in terms of what I had noted, uh, Chairperson, um, uh, those are the, 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 the responses that I, I, I would provide from where I am. If I may now ask then the CFO to address the uh, financial management specific questions that were raised by uh, Member High. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Thank you, Sue. Sure. Let me just get a sense. Let me just get a sense from honourable members. Uh, mindful of the fact that uh, the Minister of Finance will be ascending the podium at two, and the time is uh, is uh, five to five minutes to two. Uh, I want to, to to make a proposal to the members that uh, the questions that are still outstanding. In addition to the report that the CEO said uh, the, uh, she will provide, we get those uh, responses in writing so that we are then able to allow uh, honorable members to, to have a first hand information and exposure to what the Minister of Finance will be providing, uh, if that is comfortable with members. I think that's a very sensible suggestion, Mr. Chairperson. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, honorable members. Thank you, thank you, honorable high. Can we then agree that uh, what we will then also do, uh, the next meeting will also then deal with the, with the minutes uh, of the last meeting that we had, when we had uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, one of the entities. Uh, and on that note, let me take this opportunity to express our appreciation on behalf of the select committee uh, to the board, uh, in particular led by the by uh, Mr. Matthews, the chairperson, the CEO, uh, and the CFO, and the other members of the delegation, also representative from the from the ministry, uh, Mr. Dwala from the Department of Transport. Uh, the staff of parliament, they allow me to express an appreciation uh, for your attendance and for ensuring that all the preparations are in order to make this meeting a success. The meeting now stands adjourned so that all of us can uh, have uh, uh, an opportunity to listen and watch uh, the Minister of Finance presenting. Thank you, honorable members. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank, thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you to the honorable members. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.